may uh, on on the cancer prostate case discussion but it will be preceded by your valuable lecture and i know uh, this topic is very commonly asked in the examination and after talking to my students i found that they have some doubts about the understanding of this genomics uh, so i requested dr mitu mitwa ghosh to um, provide some information in a lucid manner so that we clinician can utilize your knowledge in our day to day clinical practice now with this i request uh, dr gopal krishna to take over the session it is 7 o'clock and we will have to start the um, program uh, to keep it in time and uh, let me introduce dr gautam he is from hcg bangalore he is in the clinical research team and they are working on the prosthetic genomics uh, in their day to day practice so i welcome him for today's program over to dr gopal yeah well thank you very much uh, i think the area here is quite noisy i would request tarun to please uh, commence the proceedings i will be a listener because the area here is very noisy and i don't want the background noise to come into the discussion tarun please take over right, sir thank you so much uh, can we have the honor of inviting dr ranbir prasad sir to uh, uh, to introduce and give us the welcome message for the meeting for today and following that we will start with the uh, formal meeting dr ranbir prasad sir thank you sir in his Is absence maybe if if dr ranjan sir can uh, just uh, start yeah. the proceedings for the day with your permission may i yeah. uh, start yeah. with the presentations yeah you please right. start the presentation orun i have already welcome dr gautam for today's lecture he may be invited first to deliver his lecture right. on the um, uh, uh, to start the session it will be followed by case discussion so sure, tomorrow sure. Sure. you have the full responsibility of concluding sure, no problem no problem so i'll do that no problem so can we have uh, dr gautam uh, to please uh, uh, explain our students about the role of uh, genomics in uh, the cancer of prostate we all know prostate cancer has a very strong genetic linkage and uh, there are certain uh, pathological factors and the genetic factors which determine the eventual outcome and there are multiple scores available which tell us how aggressive a tumor is going to be apart from listens like the scores of decipher and all so i would request uh, the expert in this field uh, dr gautam to please shed some light uh, in, in a way which uh, the which will benefit our urological residents over to dr gautam please hello yeah one second uh, is my screen visible yes it is visible gautam uh, so basically when we uh, i'll talk about the prostate prostate i am dr gautam i work at uh, cg bangalore in the molecular and clinical genomics department so first whenever we talk about genomics we refer to only the dna and the dna products as such now there are other things like transcriptome proteomes and metabolomes those can encompass what is known as your multiomics and these together are being integrated more and more in the future to get an idea of the holistic idea of what is the tumor type now when we talk about genomic testing for a prostate cancer we are primarily looking at tissue testing as well as in certain scenarios germline testing for familial risk and as well as in patients for whom a biopsy is not possible uh, uh techniques such as looking for circulating tumor cells as well as circulating tumor dna now your voice is breaking dr gautam please um i think there's some background noise from someone else i'm not sure cuz on my end there's nothing could someone just check ah, okay um so in genetic testing there are two components a pre test counseling as well as a post test counseling so in a pre test counseling you explain the test as well as the implications of all of the results as well as what are the risks associated with testing as well as the benefits of testing post test counseling is performed is is performed after the test uh, and is usually used to 
understand the results as well as the implications of the test outcome. As in addition, the hereditary risk assessment based on the family history as well as the risk of passing down the mutations to a child as well as in other family members who have the potential of uh, uh, mutation and what is their risk assessment. Now, primarily the reason we are doing these germline mutations and testing is primarily to look for a certain subset of genes. Now, these genes are your MMR genes, which is your DNA mismatch repair genes, which is your MLH1, PMS2, MSH2, MSH6, which is usually either tested by IHC on somatic testing or by germline or by PCR. Then your double-stranded breaks, which uh, is primarily your homologous repair genes, which includes your BRCA1 and 2, your ATM and ATR, as well as another gene known as CDK12, which is also involved in the DNA repair mechanism. Now, which members are supposed to be tested is primarily patients with a family history of either prostate cancer or associated cancer risks, such as breast, colorectal, or endometrial for those suspected of mismatch repair syndromes, or patients with male breast, ovarian, exocrine, or pancreatic lesions. Second degree, any patient with a prosthetic uh, carcinoma or breast. And in patients where there is an earlier onset of cancer, certain subsets uh, of patients, uh, when on somatic testing, you do find these mutations such as BRCA1, 2, ATM you may ask them to do a germline testing to rule out the possibility that it is a germline mutation and not just a somatic mutation. Now, what I mean between somatic and germline mutation is somatic is the mutation seen primarily only in the tumor cell, while germline mutations are seen in the gametes and, and are present in all the cells. So in the genomic landscape, and uh, of precision and precision oncology in prostate cancer, there are certain targeted therapies that we are looking for. So primarily we are looking at the HRR genes to provide therapy with PARP inhibitors. Uh, we are looking at androgen receptors and androgen splice variants to give treatment with androgen receptor therapies. Uh, PIK3, AKT, and P10 pathways to give therapy with uh, PIK3, AKT, P10, mTOR inhibitors. Uh, cell cycle inhibitors such as CDK4 and 6 are now emerging targeted therapies. And on the left-hand side, you can see the molecular subclassifications of uh, the cancer group, uh, the cancer genomic atlas, where ERG uh, fusions are the most common, followed by another uh, mixed uh, bag of tumors, which is classified as others. But of a specific subgroup, it is those with the SPOP, which is associated with higher androgen activity and respond better to androgen subgroups. And it is important to realize at which stage the tumor type is, whether it is a localized tumor to a metastatic castration resistance tumor, because the genomics of a localized prostate cancer is completely different from a prostate, uh, metastatic tumor. So now, we go on to what is known as the sequencing technique. What has happened is as a result of advancement in sequencing and sequencing technology, earlier you could do only a limited amount of genes and you could look at only uh, 500 to 600 and you could do only at a slower rate and it was very time consuming. Now, because of automation and as well as improvements in sequencing technology, instead of looking at one gene at a time, you're going to look at multiple gene, you're going to split the whole genome into its multiple genomic components and each gene will uh, undergo its reaction in the well and then it'll be joined together again. And that is why uh, next generation sequencing or NGS is also referred to as massively parallel DNA sequencing, where you split up the genome into small, small, small parts and then sequence them and then align them later on together after comparing it to a reference genome. So certain terminologies are important in NGS to remember. One is what is known as your coverage or depth. So whenever you speak to any uh, like a laboratory, they'll tell you their depth or their coverage is so and so. So what does that number imply? So for example, if someone tells you that your, whole, uh, your test has a coverage of 30x, it means that each base, that is A, T, G, C, which make up your basis in DNA, was sequenced at least 30 times. Now, throughput refers to the amount of data generated. 
So now generally a targeted gene panel generates less data, but gives you a good coverage. A whole exome generates more data, but gives you slightly lesser coverage. While a whole genome gives you a, a lot of data, but very less coverage. And another terminology you will get is variant allele frequency. Now variant allele frequency stands for at that specific site of alignment, there will be a certain uh, base. So sometimes in a patient, I imagine at base 617, there is usually a valine, but that has been changed to an alanine acid. So that how many changes has occurred at that location is referred to as a variant allele frequency. So supposing there are 10 reads at that point and four have been changed, so it gives you a variant allele frequency of four by 10 into 100, which is 40%. So this variant allele frequency can also be an indirect indicator of whether a patient has a germline mutation or not, because usually germline mutations uh, may usually have a variant allele frequency more than 50. But one point to remember is that dependent on how much of tumor you have sequenced. So like how much was the tumor burden in the uh, biopsy sample you have provided. So what is the role of genomics in prostate cancer? So basically, there are three stages from a genomic point of view that we have to look at to understand uh, at the point of whether it's an indolent tumor, whether it is a curable tumor, and when it has progressed or become a lethal tumor. So in an indolent tumor, you want to identify a subgroup of patients who would benefit from certain uh, minimal therapy or minimal interventions so as to reduce their risk of exposure to toxic uh, chemotherapies. Then there are curable prostate cancers. You want to identify uh, patients who would benefit from surgery versus radiation, as well as benefit from an aggressive or targeted therapy, as well as identify patients who have a familial risk. The similar thing is also seen in prostatic cancer, uh, lethal prostate cancer, but also with the addition of patients who have failed to a line of management or multiple lines of management. And for those, sometimes if there's a, uh, any other personalized therapy. Yes? Okay. So now whenever you go to the market. Hello. আমাদের <laughs> 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 because the entire you don't want to look at all of the genes so you want to look at only a certain subsection or a certain uh, mute. Uh, and then you have a whole exome which will look at all of the exonic regions of the genome which is uh, what is the exome of the genome and the last is the whole genome which will look at the entire genomic material but the problem generally is genomic sequencing uh, whole genome sequencing is very costly so most of the time in clinical practice, we tend to prefer a targeted gene sequence because it will cover the genes that are clinically relevant to us and give us a good coverage of those so that even at their lowest levels, we can pick them up. Whole exome is also being done, but primarily for research purposes and uh, uh, sometimes in patients for whom a targeted gene panel did not find any uh, significant mutations or targets. So now whenever we talk about an NGS, a basic workflow of an NGS employs the acid extraction. So that is either whether it's a blood sample or whether it is a paraffin embedded tissue, then you'll perform that extraction by multiple methods and then look at the quality parameters of the sample. Then it will undergo what is referred to as a library preparation. This library preparation is you breaking up the, gene, uh, the nucleic acid into smaller, smaller parts as well as tagging them with certain indicators so that the sequencer can identify its location and then align it properly during the sequencing process. And lastly, the sequencing and analysis, which will look at what is known as base calling, which will then confirm whether the patient's 
uh, A is at the correct place, T is at the correct place, G is at the correct place, C, and then align it to a reference genome. Now it will look at all of the variants. That is, if there is a mutation in BRCA, it will call that is referred to as a variant calling. And variant annotation refers to whether it, that variant or that genomic alteration that you have found is of clinical significance. This is a simplified version of what goes on in a genomic analysis. So another thing that is emerging more than next generation sequencing is also uh, liquid biopsy techniques as well as circulating tumor cells. So in terms of circulating tumor cells, there are multiple methods, but the FDA approved method is by cell search, which is uh, FDA approved for uh, prostatic cancer. And basically it was tagging the cells with the magnetic bead, isolating them, and then staining them, and then visualizing them. Here is a chart which shows how these cells look under the uh, analyzer. So here you can see there are three cells. There are uh, three major stains to look at. CK stands for cytokeratin, which stains the, uh, gives an idea of whether the cell is epithelial or not. DAPI stains the nucleus of the cell to say whether it is a living cell or a dead cell. And CD45 is to exclude uh, leukocytes or WBCs. So in all of the cells, you can see that there is a clear cytoplasm as well as a clear nucleus. This is how a CTC report generally looks at. And the cutoff for metastatic uh, prostate cancer uh, is more than five CTCs. So anything more than five CTCs is generally associated with a more unfavorable prognosis. Uh, in our own HCG data of patients with metastatic prostate cancer, we uh, around 30 to 40 patients underwent sequencing and their mean tumor mutation burden was around 6.62 uh, mutations. An actionable or uh, target was as uh, a uh, actionable uh, variant was seen in 68% of the cases. HRR gene mutations were seen in approximately a third of the cases. And temporal CRG, which is the most common fusion driver, was seen in approximately a fifth of the cases. To show a practical example of this, uh, there was a case of us which was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer and was stage four had severe bone, multiple bone and spinal metastasis, bone and cervical nodal metastasis. Had uh, it was on the third line of chemotherapy and no family history. He was recommended genomic profiling. On the genomic profiling, he had a tumor mutation burden of 8.2, which is less than the cutoff of 10. His MSI was 3.06, which is less than the cutoff of 20, as well as his PDL1 was low. Now, these three are your markers for immune checkpoint therapy. So, any patient, if any one of these markers were present, they would have benefited from addition of immune checkpoint therapy in their. Uh, 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 medical uh, chemotherapy. Then afterwards, there is a list of all the variants detected on comprehensive genomic sequencing. So in the first one, you can see AR variant is there. There's a BRCA deletion. There is a ER, uh, ERBB2 or uh, the HER2 amplification and MDM2 amplification, MET amplification, MIC amplification, and lastly, an NTRK2 translocation. And by the side of that, you can see something known as an AMP classification with various tires, a tire one, a tire two. So basically a tire one is any genomic alteration with significant clinical uh, indication as well as or an FD approved therapy. So in this case, the AR splice variant was a tier one as well as the BRCA one was a tier one and the NTRK was a uh, two was a tier one. NTRK is referred to what is known as a group of tumor agnostic markers. What that means is irrespective of whatever histology is present on the slide, if NTRK1, 2, or 3 is present, you can give therapy with NTRK inhibitors, larotrectinib and entrectinib. Similarly, tier 2 refers to patients, uh, refers to variants of known clinical significance for whom there is a trial or there is an off-label indication. Off-label refers to basically there is a targeted therapy but in another uh, cancer type. So in this patient, there's an ERBB2 amplification, which is a HER2 amplification. Now HER2 amplification drugs are already present in breast, but not very well indicated in prostate. So that 
makes it a tier two amplification. Tier three is basically of unknown significance. So basically we don't know whether there's any target currently for it, but it is known to cause cancer. And lastly, tier four with uncertain significance of prognosis and no oncogenic potential, which is also referred to as a benign variant. So in an NGS report, you will also get what is usually the uh, targeted therapies available, what is the marker for which it is available, and what is the response as a result of this. So I mentioned earlier in this patient, there was NTRK positive, so he would have responded to entrectinib and larotrectinib, and BRCA2 was positive, so he may have responded to PARP inhibitors such as Olaparib and Rucaparib. In addition, as he had certain prognostic markers such as AR splice variant, he may not respond to androgen receptor therapy, as well as BRCA deletion is associated with poorer clinical outcomes. This is the list of all the off-label therapies that are available along with their relevant clinical trials for the patient. So there are certain challenges to genomics and prostate medicine uh, in uh, prostate cancer. The major is getting access to the tumor tissue as well as getting access financial or uh, getting access to the technologies. And as well as there is no optimized or standardized method for collection of samples, genomic profiling, and what has to be done. It has to be remembered that uh, a one size fits all is not easy, cannot be easily done for all of these patients because it is all dependent on how much of tissue we get. So dependent on the tissue, what is the treatment of choice, a multidisciplinary board should be held and they can come to a consensus on which testing should be done on a priority basis, as well as um, which treatment of choice can be provided. Another thing is uh, prostate cancer is notorious to undergo severe uh, genomic rearrangements through processes known as chromotrypsis and chromoplexy, resulting in massive amounts of tumor heterogeneity. Usually in somatic mutations, uh, somatic testing that may be overlooked, but now with the introduction of liquid biopsy, molecular imaging, and um, uh, circulating tumor cells, that has come overcome to a slight degree, but it has to be, uh, how should I put it, more well established uh, for a larger scale to just not look at uh, um, just the somatic testing, but also to look at the tumor microenvironment as well as immune infiltrates. Another thing to uh, consider is in quite a lot of these genomic mutations, you get uh, genomic testings, you get multiple mutations. And these multiple mutations interact with each other. So it is crucial to look at not just one mutation, but to collectively look at all of the mutations and come to a consensus regarding therapy because certain drugs can have a downstream effect of the inhibitors. So classically in prostate, if there was a PIK3 inhibitor, a PIK3 mutation along with a HER2 mutation, uh, the PIK3 mutation would have blocked HER2 targeted therapies and hence uh, there would have been no benefit of adding HER2 targeted therapies in that patient. And another thing is usually what happens is since these patients come to us after multiple lines of therapy, the mutations and the cancer genomic alterations they get are very novel and sometimes may not be available uh, to most patients uh, to in most databases, medical databases. So it is necessary to collate as well as disseminate this information regarding the management of those who responded well, as well as those who responded poorly along with the line of management. So as to give a clear, to provide a clear, clearer line of what can be a future management based on what were your findings. And the lastly, even if you get access to a genomic testing, sometimes it is very difficult to get access to these targeted therapies and trials because quite a lot of them are in the developed world and few are there in uh, India. Uh, or rather, it is an informal communications may be necessary with other trial participants to find out uh, where the centers are and what are their inclusions and exclusion criteria and whether they are even recruiting it at times. So this is a summary of all that I've spoken about today. Thank you.
I'm done. Tarun, you are muted. Good evening, sir. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you so much for coming, joining uh, the seminar. And uh, thank you, Dr. Gautam. It was such a pleasure to uh, be uh, listening about the intricacies of uh, genomic uh, ro role of gen genetics in the management of prostate cancer. I think you made it very clear that uh, it, it is there. It, the time is not very far when uh, majority of the treatment in prostate cancer will be determined by the genetics of the person and the, and the uh, cancer per se. And every cancer is unique and the treatment might be in future modified uh, depending upon the genetic profile of the cancer which we are treating. So with this, I would like to thank you so much and uh, can we move to the second part of the webinar and uh, which is gonna be about case discussions. And I would request uh, since, since Dr. Shivam uh, sir is also there to please chip in uh, with his comments and with his questions uh, for this webinar. And do we have uh, all the four uh, students? I have their names with me, just give me a second. So um, do we have Dr. Shubhajit Balakar? Can you just unmute yourselves and make yourselves visible? Dr. Mrinal, Dr. Sachin, and Dr. Nandesh. Oh, sorry. Um, let me just see. Dr. Partho Pratim Sina. Dr. Shashi. Dr. Shashi, I see you there. Dr. Shashi is there. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Asim is there? Dr. Kishan, I'm from Guwahati Medical College. Hi, hi. And uh, Dr. Kunjan? Yes, sir, I'm here. Hi, Dr. Kishalya? Kishalya, yes, sir, I'm... Dr. Kishalya? Yeah, yes, sir, Dr. Dr. Jatin? Yeah, yes, sir, good morning. Good evening, sir. Good, good evening. I'm good Dr. Evening. Jatin. So you... Yes, please, yes, go ahead. Good evening, sir. Hi, Dr. Jatin. Can you just introduce yourself? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, sir. Myself, Dr. Jatin, SP Medical College, Odisha. Hi, Dr. Jatin. So we have all these students out here. So let's, uh, are my slides visible? Not yet. So as per me, these slides are visible. Can you see the slides? Yes, sir. yes, sir. Right. So the first case is going to be the case about uh, locally advanced prostate cancer. So the index case is a, a 56 years old male uh, who had a family history of liver mal malignancy. The father died at the age of 86 uh, because of um, mal liver malignancy. He is a 65 years old male, hypertensive, ECOG1. Uh, he has been a smoker for last 45 years. There was no previous surgeries. So he initially presented in the year 2018 with poor stream of urine, incomplete evacuation, nocturia, and this was since one year. So he was started on tamsulosin uh, from outside uh, one year ago. There was no significant relief of, of his urinary symptoms. So an ultrasound was done, which showed an enlarged prostate with bilateral hydroeconephrosis, and more so on the right side. So PVR was uh, 730 ml and the prostate was around 40 cc's. The creatinine was 7.5, serum PSA was 224. So he had retention and he was catheterized from July 2018. On DRE, the prostate was bilaterally hard, nodular, the mucosa uh, appeared to be fixed. So at the age of 65 with the history of LUX, will you not do a PSA early? So as you see uh, in this presentation that the PSA examination was done almost a year after his symptoms uh, and the opportunistic, uh, opportunistic screening could have been done. So what would, what would be your opinion? What Would you like to do a PSA early or would you like to do a PSA at any point of time during the management of the patient? Do you have any specifications for managing the PSA? Shashi. Sir, if patient came with the uh, LUTs on first visit and uh, we uh, do uh, DRE, if we suspect uh, in DRE any abnormality, then we must do PSA at first, uh, first visit, uh, otherwise on shared decision making. Good. So what is the consensus about screening in the uh, PSA, in the current era? So what does the AUA recommends? What does the UPSTS, uh, the United States Task Force recommends? 
you know, just that task force uh, recommend uh, uh, PSI screening in age of 55 to uh, 69 year on the shared decision making. No, I think anybody else, anybody else would like to take the question. So what, do, what does the AUI recommend and what does the uh, US task force recommends about PSA screening? Dr. Asim, <clears throat> Dr. Asim, you're muted. <clears throat> anybody, Kunjan, Sir, Asim, hello? Arjun? Uh, hello? The patient, yes, hello? If, uh, if patient has a history of a family history of uh, prostate carcinoma. No, he doesn't have a family history of prostate cancer. He, he has father had liver cancer, not prostate no, no, cancer. Sir, I'm uh, asking about the PSA screening. Okay, okay. So if the patient has history of uh, uh, prostate carcinoma, then sir, age can be reduced uh, for 40 years. Means if the patient is above 40 years, then we can go for PSA testing. Sir. So no, what is the what is the recommendation for screening? That is my question. So what does the US task force say whether you should screen or not, or what does the AUA say? So what you are answering is the recommendation by the urological societies. So US uh, task force says that there is no role of screening. So PSA no should not role. PSA mass screening should not be done. But yes, opportunistic screening can be considered, and that's what all the uh, guide uh, guidelines of the urological societies say. So mm. any uh, Dr. Ashim, if you can, so the PSA was two twenty four. Do you believe that 224 will always mean a malignancy or it can be something else? Dr. Asim, you are muted. You have to unmute yourself. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir, this high value of PSA always indicate this a malign malignant one. No. So what is the threshold? I mean, above which you will always say that this is malignant. But, uh, above 20. So there is no threshold. You, you can have PSAs of 50, 60, even in the history of patients who have had uh, recent catheterizations, uh, instrumentations. So I, this, this, there, there is no cutoff beyond which you will always say that this is 100% malignancy. But yes, a very high PSA would be more indicative of a malignant disease. So you can never be sure just on the basis of PSA that this is malignant. So do not fall into this trap of committing that this is a malignancy. Always say that, yes, the chances of malignancy in a very high PSA is very high. I would like to evaluate this person further because there is absolutely no cutoff at which the PSA, at which you can say that the patient is non-malignant or malignant just on the basis of a PSA value. So what are the factors which can affect uh, PSA? Kunjan, this is an exam question. This will certainly be asked in Viva. Sir, so, uh, PSA can be elevated by any distortion in the tissue architecture, which may include uh, any sort of instrumentation uh, urinary tract infection, prostatitis, uh, acute urinary retention, and uh, and as well as malic. Yeah, correct. So any kind of instrumentation, any kind of intervention on the prostate, even a catheterization will lead to a high PSA. Yes. So if the person has a chronic urinary retention, would you first check the PSA or you will check it after decompression of the urinary bladder and what are its implications? Anybody can answer? Yes, sir. Pardon, please. Please repeat. So, so if, the, if, the person, retention, if the person has a chronic renal retention, would you first check his PSA or you would catheterize him, decompress, and then you would check his PSA? Sir, first we catheterize, decompress, then we check PSA. So what is the time frame at which you would check the PSA? Sir, you would do uh, the catheterization and send for PSA immediately? No, sir. At least I, I can wait three to four weeks. Three to four weeks. Well, the reason for that is during uh, catheterization, PSA may be raised uh, either due to acute urinary retention or due to catheterization. So uh, it should be reduced to baseline required at approximately three to four weeks. So why why does uh, this uh, bracket of three to four weeks comes in? Why not one week? Why not ten days? So the I mean the question is what is the half life half -life. of PSA? Half life. What is the half life of PSA? Two to three days. So it is three days. Yes. So yes. you need to have how many half three lives days. before which it, it comes down? At least four half lives. Four. four half lives. So you need at least four half lives beyond which the PSA will come down. So catheterization or any kind of intervention, wait for at least two weeks. So, uh, you can even go ahead for three to four weeks and then check the PSA levels. So how does the family history affect uh, prostate cancer? So you have just had a presentation by Dr. Gautam. So uh, does family history has any implication on prostate cancer? And if yes, then what is a strong family history? What is the definition of having a strong family history in, in terms of prostate cancer? 
anybody can take that uh, first degree relative and sir siblings so how many siblings siblings so the see two, there is a definition given the in two. tamil clearly what is a high risk of prostate cancer high family mm. strong family history i'm sorry strong family mm. history mm. so more than two siblings uh, are affected uh, siblings so you you might not have siblings i mean without first, siblings also there can be a family history so first okay. degree relatives is the most first important degree. thing yes. Yes. so you need to have at least uh, a, a history of prostate cancer in two uh, first degree relatives blood relatives jatin is there Yes, sir. Hello, Jatin and Doctor Atharva. So next questions are going to be for Jatin and Doctor Atharva because they were not answering. So ultimately, he was advised at trust biopsy six cores, five out of six cores were positive. So why six cores? Jatin or Kishalya? Yes, sir. Already the PSA level is high, and sir, nodularity prostate is there. Correct. So then, then we can go away with the six uh, second biopsy. Said, Correct. Uh, so the the idea of uh, prostate biopsy in this patient is not to map the disease; it is just to confirm. So six cores in this particular scenario may be sufficient. So five out of six cores are positive. The biopsy is adenocarcinoma prostate, listens three plus four seven, and uh, they did a bone scan which showed no abnormalities. <coughs> he was started on tablet bicalutamide, hundred milligrams twice daily, and he was different. So there are certain errors in this particular uh, slide. So ten, can you tell me what are the errors? So, what bone scan is done in this patient? So, you tell is, me, uh, what would you like to have? Uh, sir, this patient is glycerol three plus four. That is get group right. get group two. Correct. Uh, in this, so bone scan not indicated in this case. With the PSA of two hundred twenty four, you would not go for a bone scan. Yes, sir. Uh, PSA greater than two hundred twenty four, then we go for bone scan. Bone scan. So the PSA was two hundred twenty four. Uh, sir, in the biopsy, informations are not provided sir, completely. Sir. Exactly. So the information mm. is not complete. So even in the biopsy is very incomplete. So we need much more elements of biopsy. You need to know what were the core positivity. I mean, irrespective of the, uh, of the of case which we are dealing with, you need to understand what is the what is the pattern sir, any, of the core involved. Any form pattern right. is there or not, sir? Correct. So you need much more information on that. So bone scan in today's scenario, would you, if you, if you have all the armamentarium available, would you do a bone scan or would you do a, a PSMS scan for a systemic staging? Sir, or is bone I, scan sufficient? Sir, if I have a PSMA available, then I would... Do you have any a, clinical evidence or any uh, uh, evidence or as per the medical literature which says that one is superior over the other? So PSMA PET, we can... Uh, PSMA PET is best. Why? The How evidence you know suggests that the... the what is the evidence? Be, we are able to stay the disease. What is the evidence? Can be, sir, what is the evidence? Sir, sir, PSMA PET can detect more than 30% of the lymphoid metastasis in comparison to conventional CT or MRI. So do you know any study which has proved this? So now we have level one evidence, which is an RCT, which was published in Lancet around two years back, which says that in high risk prostate cancer, so mark my words, in high risk prostate cancer, PSMA scan is better than a combination of CECT as well as a bone scan. And the practice of just advising a bone scan to evaluate a metastatic workup, which was there is not to be done at all. If you want to do a bone scan, always do in conjunction with a CECT uh, chest and abdomen. Right? So CECT chest and abdomen is for visceral metastasis. It will give you the lymph nodal status and a bone scan. But now with level one evidence saying that PSMA is better whenever it's available, go for a PSMA scan. But the evidence is towards a high risk category only. The evidence is not for the uh, low risk or the intermediate risk category. We extrapolate it for low risk and intermediate also, but the evidence is for high risk category. So, is the dose of bicalutamide correct? 100 milligram twice daily? No, sir, it is 150 milligram TDS. No, sir, 150 TDS. 150 TDS. For complete and complete OD, sir. 50 milligram TDS. 50 milligram OD. 150 OD or 50 milligram TDS. The dose is different for two different things, sir. It is. See, the older dose is 150. So the older dose, so somebody said 50 milligram OD. I think that is the best answer for this. So one, 150 milligram was used initially for no, no, complete no. androgen blockage. Mm. 50 milligram is the practice dose these days. And 100 milligram BD, that is 200 milligram one, uh, in, in 24 hours is no dosage. 
So that is Sir, please not repeat. Indicated. I can't understand. What is the dose? So if you want to answer as a complete androgen blockage, which was done previously with the help of bicalutamide, complete androgen blockage is 50 milligrams thrice daily. Okay. But yes. now you do not use complete androgen block. I mean, bicalutamide for a complete androgen blockage. So you do not use that. So the standard dose for suppressive uh, dose for bicalutamide is 50 milligram once daily. Okay. Right. 50 milligram once daily. The serum so, PSA. The, sir, uh, sir, in is, this patient, we, yes. we uh, uh, complete androgen blockage is required. No, we would not. We, we okay, have sir. not staged him yet. So how can we commit? I cannot commit. I cannot comment whether androgen blockage is required for him at all or not. So he was started on this. And in okay, today's okay. Asian era, I would never uh, depend upon bicalutamide to start to uh, give a complete androgen blockage. That is for sure. Okay. All right. Just give me a second. All right. So subsequently, his PSA was evaluated again, which was 69.34. So we have already discussed that should we start bicalutamide monotherapy here? This was practiced at least around 10 years back once we were students, it was given. But nowadays it is it is not to be given. It has been conclusively shown that it does not have any kind of OS benefit. It does not have any kind of cancer uh, benefit per se. So PS, he subsequently, he was counseled to, because technically he falls into a high risk category. He was counseled for a PSMF at CT scan. So this is what the PSMA says. Increased PSMA uptake in the enlarged prostate, and there is uh, evidence of local regional disease in the form of right seminal vesicle is involved, and the bladder waste is also involved. There is no evidence of regional or distant metastasis. Now, what do you call this stage as? So, is it T3, uh, T3B? T3B. N0, M0. Are you sure? N0, M0. Correct. So indenting the bladder base is not involvement of the bladder base. Bladder neck is not involved. So don't label it as a T4 lesion. So this is a T3B N0 M0 lesion, correct? Correct. So this is just for the uh, sake of showing the images. What is this image called? This is a PSMA PET CT scan image. What is this image called? You must just, just get into the radiology questions. What is this image of the person with the hand standing like this called? Anybody? So these, these are called maximum intensity projection images. All right, maximum yep. intensity projection images. Can somebody quickly tell me what are the areas where the physiological uptake of PSMA happens? Uh, you, you guys have all read the reports. So in what areas PSMA collect physiologically? That's not tumor. What are the areas Wrong of your body in which PSMA is there? Liver, kidney, thyroid, and adrenals. See, you can see the image there. So what are liver, the Liver, adrenals, uh, kidney. And so thyroid. Adrenals, no. Liver, kidney, thyroid, thyroid, the crimal glands. Yes. Right. So whenever you read the reports, this is going to be normal physiological uptake seen in blah, blah, blah. These kind of four organs they would mention. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's move to the next slide. So to summarize, this guy had an initial PSA of 224. The later PSA was 69.34. This was before bicalutamide was started. So the increment of 224, so somebody said that, no, this is going to be 100% malignant or metastatic. Do not commit that. So PSAs can be fallaciously high. There can be lab errors. There can be multiple factors by which PSAs can be higher. So his nadir PSA probably was around the tune of 69 to 70. His biopsy was suggestive of a glisten. Uh, this was a review of biopsy. So initially it was 3 plus 4, but subsequently once we checked it, it was 4 plus 3, but remained as glisten uh, 7. MRI was also done uh, along with the, uh, the um, PSMS scan. So if there is a conflict between an MRI, so the, if you can see that MRI says it's a T3A disease. T3A means it is just invading the capsule, possibly invading or indenting a capsule or a long, long capsular contact. Can somebody tell me what is a long capsular contact on an MRI? So what is a T3A lesion on MRI? Quickly, can somebody can tell me? Sir, T3A lesion is only extracapsular extension, either unilateral or bilateral. Correct. So at times you do not see uh, extracapsular extension. So if the capsular contact, if the tumor is more than two centimeter in contact with the capsule, the probability of this being a T3A is high. So the radiologist will label this tumor as a T3A tumor. So the capsular contact 
as well as an evident of gross extra capsular extension com- encompasses mm. a T3A lesion. Mm. So if there is a discrepancy, see there is a T3A lesion on an MRI, but the PSMA has told us that this is a T3B lesion. Mm. What will you consider more more important, PSMA uh, staging or an MRI staging? MRI. Why? So the MRI has better anatomical uh, delineation compared to the PSMA PET CT. So the correct you are you are nearly there. The correct answer is that PSMA is not meant for local staging. Yes. PSMA is meant for systemic staging. Mm. MRI is meant for local staging. The answer is that because obviously the anatomical delineation with all the multi parameters which which the MRI provides, it is very good for local staging. PSMA and any kind of PET has a noise. So at times you will uh, realize that there was no seminal vesicle invasion, but because of the noise, there is color over the seminal vesicle, and the and the uh, uh, the nuclear medicine guy would tell us that this is a seminal vesicle invasion. So always for local staging MRI for a systemic staging PSM. Right? Let's proceed. So the patient had uh, uh, bothersome urinary symptoms. So would you add anything for him immediately to decrease the symptoms? Yes, sir. Alpha blocker. Why not uh, uh, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors or why not bicalotamide or why not ADT? ADT. 5-alpha. So alpha blocker and 5-alpha reductase alpha, 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 alpha blocker should be started as a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Uh, they will not be. The size of tumor is, size of prostate is. Uh, uh, alpha alpha whether <clears throat> prostate cancer, see, these all three drugs are going to give you a low PSA level yeah. subsequently. So 5-alpha reductase might decrease the PSA uh, in, in six months time, but rest of the medications will hamper the PSA levels, will hamper the treatment. So do not start anything immediately apart from alpha blockers in these patients. First of all, you diagnose, you stage these patients, have a treatment plan, and then go for other options. So if they have urinary okay. symptoms, start them on 5-alpha reductase, oh, sorry, uh, you start them on alpha blockers, do not start them on any other medication. Uh, TURP, what is the consensus about TURP? Sir, TURP can be done uh, to cath- make the patient catheter free. Correct. So what is what is this TURP no. called as? This is a conventional channel TURP. 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 What is a channel TURP versus uh, a conventional TURP? So TURP. So in channel TURP, only uh, minimum oper- operative procedure done to pass the urine. That is 5 and 7 o'clock or medial log only are dissected. Correct. So you just make a urinary channel so that the patient is catheter free. The target is not do, uh, for doing a completion, complete TURP. All right. One second. So the patient has had a catheter for three months. Do you do you believe that urodynamic study will be required in such patient? No. There is no use. So if you suspect anything, go for a urodynamic study. Otherwise, urodynamic study does not have any role. So now we are coming to the main part of the discussion. So what is your treatment plan for this patient? So PSA 66, glycine 7, 4 plus 3, uh, T3A disease as per the MRI. Fit patient, ECOG 1. Catheterized Sorry. because he had an AUR, severe LUTs to begin with. Sir, it is a uh, high risk uh, prostate cancer. Uh, right. I can counsel, I, I will counsel the patient regarding radical prostatectomy with limb nodal dissection. Why radical prostatectomy? This is a uh, localized. Um, uh, this is not a localized. So the term which we are supposed Lo- local, to use local, is a locally, locally advanced local, prostatectomy. Local, 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 local advanced CA prostate. Uh, there is a no obvious involvement of the rectum or urinary sphincter. And, hmm. and MRI shows there is a no, uh, there is a no local uh, involvement. So there is a uh, operable tumor. So it's my right. first preference uh, ECUG one. My first preference is radical prostatectomy, or the the radiotherapy can be done. So the what, what other plan is radiotherapy? Only radiotherapy? It radiotherapy with androgen and androgen ADT with along with ADT. Along with ADT, along with anything else? Abiraton. Sir, <laughs> so abiraton can be used only in high risk cases. Exactly. So this is a high risk patient. This is a high risk. Now, if there is a more than uh, 50, uh, more than uh, three code positive, most of the code is uh, four or five, and then we can, not be uh, and then we can uh, uh, add it along with it. 
Abiratron as of now is not added so for in, a M0 local, in a localized prostate cancer or a local regional prostate. It, it is added for a patient who has metastasis either to the nodes or if he has metast oligometastatic disease in which you are using an RT, then you add abiratron. So abiratron in this particular case, still there is no evidence. I know people still tend to use abiratron for this, but abiratron in a localized disease does not have any kind, localized or local regional, confi confining to the prostate and the nearby areas, it is not indicated. Okay, sir. Any, any takers for a multimodality therapy? So what is a multimodality therapy and how, would, how does it vary? So multimodal therapy it is surgery along with either Ashim, Ashim, can you just hold on for a while? I mean, the other guys are not just including the, themselves in the discussion. Jatin or uh, anybody else would be like to like to answer these questions. Jatin, Atharva, Punjan. And there's, and there's. Multi, sir, multimodal, sir, uh, we can go for radiotherapy followed by uh, ADT, then uh, uh, chemo with angelotamide. Or... No, but that's not a multimodal therapy. So that's what the question is. Uh, so multimodal therapy means you already know that this patient will require multiple modalities of treatment. So you offer him surgery just as a part of the treatment. You know that this patient will also eventually require a radiotherapy. So you give him ADT, you operate, and then you take him for uh, radiation. So is, is there a benefit of this therapy or you would be happy with surgery and then following the patient or you'd be happy with radiotherapy? So my, my question is about literature evidence. So does multimodality therapy has any advantage over conventional modes of therapy, single mode of therapy? No, no, sir. Yes, sir. It does. Yes, sir. No, yes. yes. Multimodal, multimodal therapy has an advantage. Correct. So multimodal therapy has an advantage. In a fitter patient who has a locally advanced disease, you can still offer him a multimodality therapy and surgery can be a part of it. So the advantage uh, cited in the literature is to the tune of 10 to 12%. Some uh, articles say it is 15%. But yes, multimodal therapy certainly has an advantage. So the patient was counseled about both or all the three modalities available for him. Yes. So how do you discuss, how do you tell the patient that what therapy may be better? See, this is a very common scenario. The person says, uh, boss, you tell me what is best for me. I do not know. I do not understand the medical literature. So how do you counsel the patient what therapy is better for him? Surgery or radiotherapy? Do not quote me any anecdotal or any experiences. Please quote me what the evidence says and please quote me what the guidelines say. In this case, particular case, surgery is preferable. What yes. is the guideline which you are basing your decision upon? So the guideline says that uh, if a patient has uh, significant urinary complaints, uh, high IPSS score or uh, uh, poor, if this patient has already gone into retention, he had history of frequency, etc. So radiotherapy will not be preferable in such cases. Surgery. No, if I say, see, I agree with you, Kunjan, absolutely agreed with you. So the surgery will be a better option in this particular patient, but there is an option uh, by which you can make this patient fit for even radiotherapy. Can somebody tell me what is that option? And Sir, we can uh, first do channel TRP, make the present exactly. Then we go for yes. You yes. do a channel TRP, relieve his LUTs, make him catheter free, uh, ask him to take ADT along with uh, radiation therapy. So, but yes, I agree with Kunjan that yes, uh, to, even to my understanding, as as well as to uh, if we go according to the guidelines, a fit patient, significant LUTs, ready. Uh, both all the options should be discussed. But as we are surgeons and the guidelines also are supportive, we might. Uh, be inclined more towards a radical prostatectomy. So how do you know, uh, is there any basis by which you can calculate that how much uh, is the rate of relapse in these patients or uh, BCR depending upon what modality do you choose? So I'm not asking you the percentages. Do you know any formulas? Do you know any calculators? Do you know any predict predictive models? Briganti, no. Sir, overall survivability uh, 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 is better uh, and uh, Disease-free survivability better in case of surgery than it is. Uh, see, it's 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 kind of controversial. So I mean, it, if you are in a urological meeting, you will say surgery. If you are in the, in the meeting which uh, has radiotherapists, they will never have to do it. So just tell me, are there any predictive models? Do you know any predictive models which can tell you preoperatively? Uh, so start with the oldest ones. So these were there in really? Campbell also. So there are, there are certain nomograms which are available. Can anybody answer that? What are the nomograms which can predict how 
the relapse patterns are going to be what is the chances of success all right read them so there are multiple models available the earliest one is pattern nomogram but there are multiple other nomograms available which can assess with the help of biopsy findings with the uh, help of psa with the help of mri findings and they can tell you uh, what is the relapse chances in the patients who have had surgery versus who have had uh, who will be going for radiotherapy so these are the uh, older guidelines but yes these stay true to till date so if you are offering radical prostatectomy offer them up to a patient who has a high risk prostate cancer with a life expectancy of more than 10 years or as a part of multi modality therapy now th this answers my question so multi modality therapy has a 15% advantage over single therapy and whenever you are doing this in these kind of surgeries you have to perform an extended pelvic lymph node dissection now tell me what is an extended uh, pelvic lymph node dissection what is an, what is a standard pelvic lymph node dissection in the standard lymph node dissection we include obturator lymph nodes along with external iliac lymph nodes but in extended we include internal iliac lymph nodes also and what is extended uh, obturator lymph nodes external iliac and internal iliac lymph nodes no there is a limit so you go up to the aortic uh, mesenteric artery I then to the bifurcation no ima is super extended inferior mesenteric artery is super extended up to the bifurcation of the aortic bifurcation of Said. Yes, so there is there is a slight controversy. If you read the NCCN guidelines in prostate, they say extended lymph node dissection is what Shashi said One up level to below. the bifurcation of the common iliacs. But if you read the same thing for bladder, the extended lymph node dissection is up to the uh, One level. Super extended up to the iliac. I do not know the reason for this. I have asked a couple of people. I have no clues why the uh, definition varies in prostate as well as in the prostate uh, uh, bladder cancer. So another question which will come to you is uh, tell us something about the radiotherapy which you will be using in this patient. What is the preferred modality of radiotherapy, and what are the other modalities that you know of? Uh, uh, I am at. I am at. What is I? So don't use mnemonics. You, Inten you tell us the intensity modulated radio. Intensity. Intensity modulated image radiotherapy. I M R T I G R T. Why do we use IMRT, 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 IMRT. Intense. Intensity modulated radiotherapy, image guided radiotherapy, IMRT slash IGRT. So why do we use this? We include dosage of radiotherapy without uh, uh, and with less complication. Why we, less complication? We increase, so we want to are, radiate only the prostate if, uh, and spare the other organs around it. So we can target so the intestine. The, so the prostate is a mobile organ with every breath you take the prostate moves with every contraction the prostate moves it keeps on imaging your prostate and gives gives a focal therapy only to the prostate uh, preventing the collateral damage uh, to the other structures now uh, is there any other modality of uh, uh, radiotherapy which you know of which are which is which theoretically may be much more beneficial as IG, as compared to igrt imrt the volume guided yeah. uh, Radiotherapy. So there is one one center which has just come up in India and in, uh, in conjunction with Tata uh, Tata Memorial Center Bombay. So what is that therapy? Now it is available in India. High dose osteotactic radiotherapy. So SBRT was already there. So now the proton beam is also available. So proton beam is also now available in India, and we have one center in which now you can give proton beam, uh, beam therapy to these patients. All right. So, uh, if you give ADT, what is your schedule of giving them androgen deprivation therapy? Would you advise an orchidectomy to this patient if you are giving radiotherapy? No, sir. Why not? No, sir. Why not? Because this is not uh, orchidectomy, is not irreversible, sir. Uh, patient has localized, uh, localized so advanced state. Patient says, "I don't want any reversibility. Give me, give me a simple solution. Do an orchidectomy." Side effect profile, sir. Orchidectomy side effect profiles, hot flushes, that can be avoided. Sir. So the same profile is going to happen with injections. Sir, or uh, generally, uh, even with patients, eco is good, sir. Patients, no, you are giving him radiotherapy. You are giving me androgen deprivation therapy along with radiation therapy as a conjuncture. So the patient says, "Why don't you do an orchidectomy for me?" Send me a straight answer. Sir, in this case, there will be uh, uh, adrenal is also a source for the test. Sir, so, edit, edit so, will be performed two to three years. So why we uh, perform? Uh, Yeah, precisely, precisely. This is the answer. So you give it for two years. You do not give it give it as a lifelong therapy. So yeah. why are we thinking about adrenal sources and why are we thinking about the cost benefit and hospitalisation? The treatment is for two years. 
you give uh, ADT for two years, if you do not get it's going to be a lifelong deprivation of androgen deprivation, which you do not want. So you just give it for two years. So that is why injections are used. Yeah, what, what kind of injections are available for uh, androgen deprivation? Give me the names of uh, antagonists as well as uh, and their doses. Please, please, ek ek karke, please, one, one person at a time. So I, it's, it's getting very confusing. So, anybody? Yes, LHR okay. okay. yes, antagonist, antagonist includes the uh, Degaralix. Degaralix. Yes, sir. we start with those 240 milligrams. Correct. Uh, starting those and 80 milligrams uh, every four weekly. We, uh, Right. So, Shashi, can you tell me what is the problem with Degar LX loading dose? Where do you give it? Uh, sir, it is subcutaneous injection, sir. And uh, which area? Uh, arm? No, sir. No, arm? The, no, no, sir. In the abdomen near about um, like a sir. In fact, okay. Subcutaneous. What is the problem with uh, 250? What, what, if you have given, a lot of patients will complain that. Tell me what is the problem with the patients? Sir, uh, inje injection site pain and uh, right. allergic reactions. Absolutely. What is the allergic reaction which they have? Histamine like reaction, sir, redness and itching. Redness and itching. Perfect. Very good. Asim, what is the yes, uh, agonist? Sir, Bosserolin. Uh, okay, dose? I could not remember. Bulge. Next. Next, next, next. Bosserolin. What is pamarillin? What does pamarillin consist of? Partho? What is pamarillin? Uh, pamarillin is, uh, sir, it's an uh, antag uh, agonist. What is the chemical? What is the compound name? Triptorillin, boss. Triptorillin. What is the dose? Triptorillin. What is the dose? Sir, 11.25. For three months. And what is the dose of uh, luprolide? It is half. 22.5 milligram for three months. Perfect. So never get confused. 22.5 milligram is luprolide, 11.25 milligram is triptorillin. Right? Chalo. Next. So he basically selected for going for surgery, had a robotic assisted radical prostatectomy, non nerve sparing. Was the surgeon correct in doing this? Yes, sir. Why? Sir, no, sir. But right side, there is extra, external uh, pelvic. Uh, right side, the seminal vesicle and uh, nodes were involved. Sir. So, left side, uh, it would have been sir, nerve sparing. No, I would say the surgeon was absolutely correct. Despite sir, the fact in the, in the conference, they would the say that. It's a high risk decision. So, what is the guideline? What is the NCCN guideline? It's, it gives you a percentage that if, if, if the chances of nervous involvement is higher, do not go for uh, nerve spare. So read that. It's in the NCCN guidelines. He was, he was an, I mean, he recovered very well. Catheter was out on the sixth post-op day, voiding okay, some incontinence. The biopsy report was 4 plus 3, 7. Right side, there was focal margin positivity. Glissons pattern 4 at the margin. Other margins were free. So what do you, any other information do you need? Extension. Any other information do you need? Lymph nodes, sir. Lymph nodes are there. Like zero it. out of 11 on the left, right side and zero out of 14 on the left side. I can give it. not involved. So you should always know about seminal vesicle status, always know about extra. You should always know about extra prosthetic extension. This is not mentioned here. So the stage basically is T2 according to the pathology report, but you need to be very sure about PNIs. You need to be very sure about LVIs. You need to be sure about extra prosthetic extension. You, if it is a pattern for you need to be know about the pomato pattern, whether pomato pattern was there or not. These are the things which are missing in this biopsy report. Now, what would you do? Focal margin positivity. Surgery done. I, I could add really really the no, focal margin is positive. Then we may go for the uh, vaccine rating surveillance. Sorry, Shashi, uh, you would go for? 
if focal margin is positive, hmm. then uh, active surveillance and watchful waiting is the option. Active surveillance, but watchful I, waiting, both are wrong. But I will, add, I will want to add radiation therapy along with it. No, no, just one second. So the first of all, let me address Ashashi. Active surveillance and watchful waiting, both are terms used for absolutely different disease processes. Hmm. Do not use model. the terms loosely. I know what you mean to say, but no, both are wrong. Never use active surveillance or never use uh, watchful waiting in a patient who has already had a surgery. Correct. So, so your answer has to be followed. Now, somebody said that radiotherapy. Some who, who said uh, that uh, radiotherapy will be given to this patient? Sir, uh, sir, I want radiotherapy. You wanted Asim wanted radiotherapy. Why do you want radiotherapy? Just because, because of margin a, positivity? Is this is margin positive along with this. Uh, there is a pattern four. So, recent pattern four. Is the so high risk this disease. pattern four high risk disease, which has been taken out, would you recommend radiotherapy in today's day and era? Or would you wait? So, the question can be reformatted adjuvant radiotherapy versus salvage radiotherapy. What kind of radiotherapy would you prefer in today's day and age? Sir, uh, salvage radiotherapy. So, then why are you advising him an adjuvant radiotherapy without even knowing how his PSA is? Because there is a disease already present. Doesn't matter. Sir, disease already present is there. There is a margin positive. So margin positivity can also mean intraprostatic extension. It doesn't always mean that the tumor is there inside the patient. And if you are advising a salvage, then why are you saying that you are giving him adjuvant? So you basically just on the basis of pathological report are advising him radiotherapy. And I think in today's day and age, you are wrong to advise a radiotherapy in an adjuvant setting. So you have to wait for his PSA and see what happens. This is his PSA after six weeks. Mm. Would you still like to give him radiotherapy? No. 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 So where is the yes, question sir. of margin positivity? Why the margin positivity was very important in your treatment decision making? So margin positivity tells you that this patient might fail in future. Very important predictor for the patient might fail in future, but will fail in future is a different question. He has a higher probability of failing, but he will fail is a wrong conjecture. What my point? So in yes, as far as there was in earliest, earlier days, we used to give them adjuvant therapy based upon the factors which you said, high glycens, high risk scores, margin mm -hmm. positivity. So three factors or two factor positive, these patients were subjected to uh, uh, adjuvant radiation. But post radical trials, the radical trial, remember this word, radical trial. So it said that even if you delay and you start early salvage, it is sufficient. You do not need to give them adjuvant. What is the cutoff at which you give, if we consider uh, salvage radiotherapy? As per the recent NCCN guidelines. Point two. Rubber 15. Exclamation mark. 50. Sorry? How much? Point, point 0.4. No, wrong. Any other guesses? This is there in the NCCN, boss. You have to read the NCCN. This is very important for you. So the, the previous version of NCCN said point 0.2. Yes. We still practice point 0.2. But if you read the latest version, 2022, it says point 0.1. So oh. the earlier you start salvage, uh, the better the outcomes are going to be. But all practical purposes, if you ask any urologist, they would be comfortable starting only after the PSA goes beyond 0.2. Right? Yes. But you have to know both. You have to know both. So 2022 says 0.1. The earlier version say 0.2. The still older version used to quote 0.4. But 0.4 is absolutely out of the uh, discussion. So 0.2 or 0.1. Right. So how would you follow up this patient? Anybody? Punyan, Tapan, anybody? Uh, after the immediate post-op visit, we'll uh, uh, follow up the patient every uh, uh, every six months for three years. For three years? In first six years months. Three Where does this function, this, this, this uh, follow-up comes from? In first year, sir, three months, six months, and twelve months. Then absolutely. After... Mm -hmm. So it is. It is. So your she was near the mark, but yes, I. I mean, general recommendation is you follow up these patients every three monthly, for at least initial two years. Then you can relax your follow up, say by the tune of six months, 
but you mm. have to follow them lifelong so there is no end to there is nothing like two years or four years or five years of follow up with these patients okay. so um what what do you want to advise this this patient had a margin positivity would you go and go for any imaging imaging is not needed sir psa value imaging is not required so the only follow up which will be required is psa psa, PSA value PSA. we have to psa value. and yeah, symptom for the progression also so interval we have discussed investigations we have discussed psa at the end of 3 months was 0.004 patient is very happy the doctor is very happy psa at 9 months 0.05 at 2 years 0.15 now what are you going to do Okay. Now, uh, the patient. We have to think of uh, the patient. May we have to follow up, sir. Since still the patient is not in the sir, zone of uh, salvage therapy, uh, sir. No, so perfect. we have to follow. So you up, basically have to keep on following him up. Once yes. he crosses the limit of point two, you have to uh, start salvage oh. radiotherapy. Yes. So what is the recent data of salvage radiotherapy radical trials there's an update in asco about radical trial anybody has an idea if you are giving radiotherapy how long are you supposed to give the adverse deprivation 3 months prior no sir yes. three months two years three months prior three months so anybody knows about the updated radical trial results yes. do not speculate do not speculate just tell me the results so the the trial basically assess whether you give radiotherapy alone in a salvage scenario with radiotherapy with 6 months of adt and radiotherapy with 2 years of adt so now what they found that either you give them for 2 years or either you don't give them 6 months adt is not something which should be given to these patients so either you give them you give them for 2 years or you don't give them at all the results are similar but 6 months fares very poorly i still do not understand that paper why the results are like that but it's just an abstract which has been released we are waiting for the final paper to come in but yes your answer is going to be that you are going to give him radiation and you have to give him androgen deprivation therapy for at least 2 years yes. all right so i think with this we should conclude the first case right so biochemical relapse we have already discussed how do you define failure we have already discussed at what point of time would you investigate the patient with a psm scan is yes. if the psa level goes from beyond 0.2 you can ask for a psm scan yes. all right so this concludes my first discussion if if dr shivam or somebody uh, has uh, any uh, inputs please take over sir tarun the first input is you did a wonderful job a very Thank good you, uh, kind of a presentation and the whole uh, thing was very well presented so uh, the few things that i might mention from is one of them is uh, when you are doing uh, one was the dr gopal presented with the genomic which was i think still a very theoretical proposition and uh, we are uh we need to know exactly when uh, in our clinical practice we need to do a genetic testing right so uh, at present uh, i think we are doing at the level of metastatic uh, prostate cancer or probably when it is crpc right Sorry. and secondly you ask about uh, when we uh, you talk about uh, rise in psa due to other reasons uh you, one should ask about ejaculation also whether the patient Absolutely. had a, uh, immediate ejaculation so one thing and uh, when you talk about cancers uh besides prostate cancer uh, uh family cancer syndrome that is when uh, if i have multiple cancers in the family that also should be taken the, in the history Please. that can also is very important in determining whether this patient can have a prostate cancer when you talk about complete antigen blockage uh, we used to say when bicalutamide has to be added to your uh, uh, anti uh, antigen deprivation therapy with bicalutamide no more we do this uh, complete antigen blockage when we talk about giving 150 mg of bicalutamide that was a monotherapy of bicalutamide 
and you didn't give any other androgen deprivation therapy and only gave bicalutamide. So that at that time we used to give 150 milligram. Otherwise, uh, the standard dose is 50 milligram daily, even for a complete androgen. Uh, you talked about PSMA PET CT uh, uh, about that Lancet article. Uh, which was published, but I think still the guidelines are still not very clear about uh, this, uh, whether a PSMA PET should be done uh, for staging of the prostate cancer or not. So uh, still, if somebody says CT scan and a bone scan, uh, he is perfectly all right. Uh, about the multimodal therapy, yes, if the multi, uh, if Probably this is more relevant in case of an oligometastatic prostate cancer, where we usually give a multimodal treatment. For a, a locally advanced prostate cancer, yes, uh, it can be a part of the treatment. But usually, uh, when you think that radio radiotherapy has to be given after surgery, then probably you would not do surgery. Rather, you would straight go ahead with radiotherapy. Uh, only thing is, when you are doubtful, then probably plus minus radiotherapy, then you might add radiotherapy after the surgery. When you talk about the margins positive, in this case, there were focal margin positive. So probably you may not need a, uh, early, you may not add an adjuvant radiotherapy here, but if the margins are widely positive, then probably one is, uh, one can give an adjuvant radiotherapy. I think these were a few comments and uh, you, you did a very good job. Uh, I have to leave for some time. I might join you sometime later. Certainly. Uh, you... Sure, right? sir. Thank you so much, okay. sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll move with the uh, final case presentation. Uh, we'll quickly run through this. This is an oligometastatic disease. Uh, so are my slides visible? Yes. <clears throat> right. So we are not going to take too much of time in this. We are just going to rush through. Let me just see. Uh... Sir, I have one question, sir. Certainly, please, please shoot. Yes. Sir, in uh, after radical prostatectomy and extend, extended PLND, if hmm. we get uh, uh, node positivity, what is the hmm. role for adjuvant uh, radiotherapy there? Right. So, if you have node positivity, my recommendation and the guideline recommendation would be still wait for the PS elements. See, node positivity will tell you that you will certainly it's a systemic disease. It's no, it's no more a uh, disease which is confined. So you would eventually 100% have to give him an ADT along with radiation therapy. That there is no doubt about it. So what we practically do is that we wait for the PSA to come in. We tell the patient that boss, you are 100% going to require radiation therapy, but probably there's going to be a window before which we will wait and make him free. I mean, if his PSA is absolutely normal, we will just tend to follow. So if you read the literature and if you see the sub sub subset of patients who had a lymph node positivity around... 12 or 15% of the patients can be completely cured by surgery also. Oh. So hold your horses before the PSA starts rising. So the general practice okay. is that unless the PSA rises, you keep the patient prime that you will require radiation, but till the PSA rises and if the PSA rises, start radiation until that time, let him enjoy his honeymoon. Do not, do not give him any kind of therapy. And we have two patients who are uh, in, in last one and a half years who are lymph node positives. Both are doing well. So once the PSA rises, we are going to start radiotherapy on them. Uh, and so is there and if it's a single lymph node with a hmm. micrometastasis, again, you can consider not to give them. If it's okay. a multiple lymph node, you are you, you kind of convince the patient that you're going to require it. Okay. Yes, sir. sir, I have one question, sir. Sure, Asim, tell me. Uh, sir, when MPMRI is indicated in case of carcinoma prostate? In all the stages, in today's day and age, carcinoma prostate, if you are suspecting, MPMRA is the first investigation. Sir, if you present, present, present with a high PSA, like more than 100, we can do MPMRA in these cases? In these cases, in which you assume that this patient is going to be metastatic, you can directly give them a PSMA. You can give a PSMA PET CT scan. If you are planning for any kind of local treatment, which is surgery versus radiation, you have to have an MRI. What my point? If the PSA okay. is very high, okay. the patient is symptomatic, he has bone pains. In this patient, there is no role for going, going for an MRI. You can even get a bone scan done. You can even get a PSMA scan done, which will prove that this is a metastatic disease and you start the treatment accordingly. Okay, sir. All right. So local staging is not required for systemic diseases. Can you just hold on for a moment? Hello, Ash and over there.
कल निकल कल निकाल दें कल निकाल दें हाँ मैं निकाल दू कल छुट्टी नहीं करेंगे परसों करेंगे ठीक है राइट सॉरी सो आई एल क्विकली मूव टू द सेकंड केस या या प्लीज प्लीज Uh, uh, in a lot of situations, the EAU and the NCCN guidelines are widely different. Which one do we quote? I follow NCCN. It depends upon what your examiner follows. <laughs> Nobody can tell that. But yes, you if you stick to one guideline, the examiner will certainly agree. So whatever you say. So this is as per whatever guidelines you say, the examiner will certainly agree. Prostate cancer is a Pandora's box, so you can hold your nose any way you want. You will find evidence in all parts of whatever you want to do in this patient, right? So fifty two. Uh, Doctor Tarun, Doctor Kanishka, here, yeah, can I just chip in with a point for about yeah, prostate cancer? Yeah. So uh, what I feel is that our residents in uh, urology should know that prostate. The, uh, we have in radiation oncology, we have something called radio biology. So the prostate radio biology actually reveals how sensitive the tissue is to. Uh, uh, So the effects of fractionation. So there is something called alpha by beta ratio. The alpha by beta ratio of prostate is one point five to three. I think it's just a small pearl. I think which residents should know. So the prostate, uh, so the alpha by beta ratio of the prostate is around one point five. So prostate malignancies are more sensitive to higher doses for fraction. So normally for prostate radiotherapy, we often adopt higher doses for fraction, which we call hypofractionated Hypo. radiotherapy. Uh, uh, Doctor Kanishwar, one important point, if you can just quickly uh, tell the residents, so, uh, th there's a question which comes in: whether you will irradiate the nodal basins, or when would you irradiate the nodal basins? Uh, for uh, low risk and intermediate risk prostate cancer patients, we need not treat the uh, nodal basins. But for high risk patients, we definitely need to treat the pelvic nodes. Correct. And one more important thing. So, in, so once we are going to the oligometastatic disease, we will discuss that. So, this, the trick question is about irradiating the prostate or irradiating the pelvis. So, I'll come to that. I'll I'll need your sure. inputs for that. Please hold on for sure. that. Sure. Sure. Right. Thank so, fifty-two years old male, diabetic, hypertension, or oral medications. Lutz with incomplete evacuation of urine from four months. Catheter was placed twenty days back. There was no other positive history. Very fit guy. Ecog one. Uh, examination all is normal. DRE shows that it's a um, sorry. It's a grade three prostate megaly, hard nodular prostate, rectal mucosa is free. He was evaluated in the hospital. PSA was seventeen point four. Free PSA was four point seven nine. Am I correct to do a free PSA in this particular scenario? No, no sir. Why? It is related in four only nanograms. Point PSA value between four and ten. Absolutely. So I have seen in my practice PS free PSA being advised for to a person who has a PSA of two and free PSA being advised to a person who has a PSA of hundred. So PSA uh, or the subsections of PSA is for the gray zone of the PSA when the PSA values are between four to ten. Not for any other scenarios. He had a bone scan. Focally increased uptake in the the left femur. It was supposed to be uh, enthesopathy, that is uh, just inflammation of the joint and skeletal metastasis. There was no evidence of any skeletal metastasis. So should we have a bone scan at this PSA level? Ashwin, no. Hello. No sir. Hello. So what do you want to have? Biopsy report first. MPMRI. Correct. You are supposed to have a MPMRI first, and then follow the sequence and do a biopsy, and then only you are supposed to go for any kind of bone scan. Ah, shit. Ah, I know. I know. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So, so I'm sorry. So um, this is the biopsy. Adenocarcinoma of the prostate. Glycans four plus four. Thirty percent of the biopsy material involved. So yes, the biopsy is incomplete. You are supposed to know all the elements of biopsy, which are not there in this. We have discussed in the previous discussion. What is your next plan of action? So this is a biopsy proven uh, carcinoma of the prostate. Somebody did a bone scan, uh, showed some kind of focal uptake in the lesser trochanter of the femur. PSA seventeen. And what what is your next point of investigation? No MRI was done. Local so staging of the MRI, MRI to be done. MRI. I have been reiterating again and again and again. 
local staging as well as systemic staging both have to be done please do not get into the trap of saying just bone scan is sufficient you need to have a cect scan also if you are going for a cect along with a bone scan if you are going for a psma that will give you the whole information please do not forget cect scans this is very important we do not uh, somehow answer cect scans if you are offering bone scan to our patients so ccts are mandatory otherwise go for a psma scan as a single modality of investigation what my point yes sir so september 2018 is repeat psa was 22.34 the trust biopsy was reviewed it was basically the same so now if somebody tells you that you are supposed to do an mri of this patient who has had a biopsy just around 2 weeks back uh, would you recommend an yeah. mri at this particular point or would you wait no. okay. i have to wait for 3 to 4 weeks 4 weeks maybe reason my mera gaadi hai ganda hum biopsy will so hum library ha टिश्यू So Correct. there is an artifact we can do Perfect. MRI in this. Window. Absolutely, absolutely. So the, this is the bang on answer. So you need to wait for at least uh, beyond two weeks, minimum two weeks, uh, before you order an MRI. So do not do not get an MRI as soon as you land your hand on the report of the biopsy of the patient. So I would not get into this is a tricky question. So what is your next plan of action? So MRI uh, MRI uh, is done. Any other imaging you would like to do? Bone scan is ambiguous. Mm -hmm. स्टेज T4. T4. Okay. This, yeah, these T4. are the images. T4. 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 Perfect. T4. These are the images. I will skip them. Uh, we will discuss these images tomorrow again in the radiology seminar. These are the MIP images. So prostate. He also had a PSMS scan done. PSMS shows that there was a uptake in the prostate and uh, voila. So what the femur was being shown on a bone scan as a enthesopathy. This is basically a metastasis. Hmm. On a PSMS scan. Okay. So just to conclude, PSA twenty two, stage CT four, single metastasis in the femur, on the PSMS scan, glissons five four plus five nine. This was on a pathological review. Comorbidities we have already discussed: diabetes and hypertension. So the this is again an important question. So this is in high risk prostate cancer, and yes, uh, I agree with Dr. Shivam that the guidelines are still very ambiguous. But in the view of an RCT and with a level one evidence available, you can go for a PSMS scan. PSMS scan is still not widely available in USA, so the guidelines are going to take time for uh, the change to happen. But European countries are already adapting to PSMS, and PSMS is a very important tool which can help you in upstaging or maybe correctly determining the stage of the disease. Now, uh, a trick question. So, can you tell me some malignancies in which the PSMS can be falsely positive? Not prostate malignancies. Some other malignancies in which PSMA can be very falsely positive, or tumors, tumors for that matter. The breast, liver. adrenal, liver. Liver. Correct. So hepatocellular carcinoma is one. Gall bladder is one. Lacrimal gland malignancies is one. Breast mm -hmm. cancers. Why breast cancers? This is again a question uh, from In Gamble. Oh. So breast tissue also secretes PSA to a certain extent. any organ which secretes psa to certain extent can show false positivity on a psma granulomatous prostatitis can be positive on a psma scan so we have had patients granulomatous prostatitis with hip replacement showing metastasis and uh, tumor in the prostate turned out to be absolutely negative inflammations acute severe inflammations of the prostate can be again positive on a psma scan Thyroid malignancies can be positive on a PSMS scan. Renal tumors can be positive on uh, PSMS scan. So be very cautious. Do not fall into the trap saying that PSMS is absolutely specific. It can be positive in at least around sixty, seventy other malignancies. 
so what is your further plan of action so i have i have charted lot of options what is the most prudent evidence based option you will select for this particular patient <coughs> sir adt plus abiratron and zirotromide first of all tell me what is what is this oligometastatic disease or whether it's a, a it's it's metastatic disease or whether you would what what kind of category this person is going to fall into and what is the basis for categorizing this patient what trial is the basis on which so you will is, categorize this patient so this is an oligometastatic disease based on the charted criteria which say that uh, there should be uh, <clears throat> Uh, a total of four or less uh, metastatic lesions uh, with at least one uh, of them outside the vertebral column and the pelvis or, and no visceral metastasis and or vertebral perfect no perfect. visceral metastasis for oligo no visceral metastasis so this is oligo metastatic disease so in oligo metastatic you again have a very special spectrum which does not have a name so this is a single metastasis so this is again a mm. Uh, probably a better disease to deal with and plus the mm. metastasis is inside the pelvis so this is slightly a better <clears throat> disease to deal with though the yes. trials do not label this as a disease uh, as a separate entity this will still be categorized into an oligometastatic setting so what is the treatment for an oligometastatic disease as of now so do i am not going into surgery at all though surgery can also be i mean the proponents of surgery can also say that we'll remove the prostate irradiate the bone done with it but no this is not something which you are supposed to answer in your examination so what do the guidelines say what will you what is the evidence based treatment for this particular patient sir adt plus enzalutamide adt plus enzalutamide no radiotherapy uh, so because there is only one lesion sir, uh, which only is present symptomatic uh, uh, seems yes, radiotherapy is for symptomatic only Bony Guys, you have wrong. to read this. You have to read this topic. Everybody is absolutely off the mark. It's very clear in the. This is an oligometastatic disease, so that's why I wanted uh, the radiotherapist to chip in into this. See what what is happening. So this, this the ideal treatment for this. patient in today's day and age as per the evidence would be radiotherapy to the prostate mm -hmm. plus minus channel trp i mean depend upon i would not get into the details of it so he might require a channel therapy adt along with radiation therapy since it is a metastatic disease you will add either abiratron enzalutamide or docetaxel to this particular patient uh plus if you are treating him with the radical intent you also give radiation therapy to the Femur. Femur. Yes. Right. So it's just one metastasis. That two in the pelvis. Even if it is one metastasis in the spine, you also irradiate it. So this is called a radical treatment, even in a metastatic setup. Mm. But in an oligometastatic disease, if you are not irradiating the uh, metastasis, that's fine. But you are supposed to treat it as a multimodal management. So the treatment has to be androgen deprivation therapy, along with radiation therapy. along with either of the three abiratron and zalutamide or docetaxel now if somebody can tell me what drug will you choose in this patient if this patient was not ecog1 and he, this patient has diabetes this patient has hypertension what is the medicine which you will use and which you will not use the zalutamide will be the preferred for this patient why not abiratron abiratron is a very safe drug why are you not giving so me a cheaper will, medication first it will cause uh, uh, cardiovascular side effects i mean sir hypertension is a side effect for abiratron so better to avoid this okay abiratron and is. the most important thing just not hypertension yes, we have prednisolone with uh, abiratron yes. exactly how much of the prednisolone do you give to these patients 5 mg pd 5 mg daily so this this is very detrimental for diabetes so this can lead to a exponential rise in sugar control so you, again not a if this patient had an history of epilepsy okay and then what is what am i then you have to divert it and then what had then we should avoid docetax then we should go for injulatamide You should avoid enzalutamide. Docetaxel in epilepsy can still be given. Yes. What if this patient had a deranged LFT? If this, if his, uh, if he has alcoholic liver disease. Again, enzalutamide is the safer option. But docetaxel. Why not abiratron? Has to be abiratron because it causes rise in LFT. Why not docet? Acha, if you are giving docetaxel, then how much of the docetaxel? Not the dose. I am not asking about the how many. No, no, not the dose. So how many cycles of docetaxel are you going to give? 
sir there are two trials sir six one is six sir, uh, cycles sir, to be given sir up front and then another is of nine cycles sir. but six cycles six to before. nine cycles yes correct six yes. to nine some but some people give 12 cycles in, uh, in divided doses but six mm -hmm. to nine is Same. the perfect answer mm -hmm. So uh, the advantage of docetaxel is that you give him six to nine cycles and then they do not need any kind of medication till they relapse. So that's the advantage. Correct. So you have answered all, but you have sir, to read. So sir, one question. Read. Yeah, please. Sir, uh, along with uh, along with angelotomide, bicarbonate will be continue. Uh, along with uh, sorry, angelotomide. Along with an angelotomide, uh, if we uh -huh. add angelotomide at a part of it. Bicalitamide will be continued or not? What will be continued or not? Bicalitamide. No, 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 no. Bicalitamide is of no use. Absolutely not. Bicalitamide throw it in the dustbin. No bicalitamide in 2023. Bicalitamide is only used for a for before you give an injection of an agonist of an agonist. Five days before, five days after was the recommendation. Now it is two, three days before, three days after. That is the only role of bicalitamide in today's day. Nothing beyond that. So the companies can sell only 10 tablets per patient. Nothing beyond that. I said, Dr. Sarkar, if he's there. Dr. Sarkar? Yes. Dr. Kanishkar. So yeah, yes, if, if you can just uh, maybe highlight a bit on this particular stage. So uh, yeah. radiation therapy, dosage, hypofractionation, pelvis. Uh, see, and, for uh, this patient, I would like to say that uh, there is no need of giving elective nodal radiation for this patient since this is a metastatic patient. I would like to treat the prostate and the subinal vesicles in a hypofractionated dose of 60 grain, 20 fractions. It will be a four weeks treatment of five uh, fractions per week. And uh, probably I will give uh, again a hypofractionated course for the femur lesion. And that Absolutely. probably can be, can be given by a uh, uh, by SPRT probably. Absolutely correct. So the the message which I wanted Dr. Kanishko to, which he has very clearly said that you do not irradiate the pelvis, you do not irradiate the retroperitoneum, even if the patient has a high volume, uh, uh, sorry, low volume metastasis. So you the the in in a low volume oligometastatic disease, the radiation is only given to the prostate. It mm. is not given to the pelvis. It is not given to the retroperitoneum. It is not given to the different four sites of metastasis. But this is a peculiar case in which you might, give, I mean, you should rather give it to the isolated site of metastasis and the choice, as he has said, is SBRT, which is very effective in these lesions. Right. Duration of ADT? Come on, come on, come on. Duration of ADT. Sir, lifelong. Sir, continue. Perfect. So in this patient, ADT is lifelong. So because it's a metastatic disease, so you can even mm. offer them an orchidectomy. But in the previous patient, you cannot offer them orchidectomy because no. it's for two years. Yes. So this was oh. a synchronous metastasis. What about a metachronous disease? Metachronous oligometastatic disease. So um. the metastasis happened later. And then the ideal regimen, uh, agent will be docetaxel. So again, the three options are valid. You discuss with yeah. the patient, you give him a veratron, enzalutamide, docetaxel, either of the three. So there is no uh, trial as of now which says that one is better than the other. The, the issue is about convenience. Right? Okay. So with this, let me end the presentation. If there are any questions, if, if you want to, me to discuss any other aspect of disease, maybe CRPC, mm -hmm. I would be happy to discuss. But these are the slides which I could prepare in a very short while. Uh -huh. So the management of CRPC, if you could uh, discuss in a short, it would be. So the CRPC depends upon what was the previous treatment given to these patients. So if these patients were given, uh, first of all, what is the definition of CRPC? Can somebody tell me what is the definition of CRPC? Nobody knows the definition. Tell me what is the definition of CRPC? Uh, so CRPC is defined as the uh, testosterone level of less than 50 nanogram per DL. Mm. Or uh, uh, along with the uh, uh, rise in PSA, and hmm. in three consecutive one uh, we three consecutive rise one week apart one week apart uh, or uh, either it is greater than two nanogram per ml or greater than fifty percent rise of the 
ऑप्शन Uh, you have the option if if it's a you have to stage him first. So if it was a M zero CRPC, no metastasis, <coughs> but the patient had CRPC. So this is a common scenario. We do not stage the patient. We offer them orchidectomy after four years, five years, they become castrate resistant. Their PSA start to rise. But we once do an imaging, there is no tumor. So this is a special subset of patients which are CRPC M zero. In these patients, there are five options: aplatumide, doralutamide, enzalutamide, abiraterone, and docetaxel. Understand? Yes. Yes, sir. Metastasis, no metastasis, only CRPC, doralutamide, uh, aplatumide, uh, enzalutamide, abiraterone, docetaxel. If you have a patient with metastasis, then go for the history. If he was only on ADT, again you have enzalutamide, abiraterone, uh, docetaxel. If he was on ADT along with abiraterone, you can try enzalutamide, but it will most likely not work. But there is no harm in giving it, giving for a trial for one or two months, but it will most likely not work. Then your option is docetaxel. If he was given docetaxel along with ADT, your options are enzalutamide versus ADT, whatever you want to start upon. So, so if the patient, tell me. So basically, whatever treatment the patient is naive to, we try that. Correct. Correct. Okay. I'll I'll just make it a bit more harder. So there is there are other trials which which say that I mean uh, you can add any other, you can add one more therapy to it. So if you are giving him docetaxel, add a biraterone to it. Mm. So that also increases the overall survival. And this is mm. a very robust uh, data which was available about increment of uh, uh, OS by three months. So people say three months, but yes, three months matter to a cancer patient. So the uh, the other option, if the patient has been given everything and he's still progressing. so now the question of genetic analysis and now the options mm. of other modalities come in mm. so if the patient has failed everything so he has failed docetaxel he has failed abiraterone he has failed enzalutamide you either rechallenging him with docetaxel mm. yes. or you give him cabazitaxel cabazitaxel most second time so rechallenge with docetaxel or you give him cabazitaxel mm. or if the patient has severe bony metastasis you can think about a very novel alpha agent now, you need to answer me what is that novel agent alpha radius which is available in calcutta lutetium 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 pcpsma is available in uh, calcutta it is very uh, beneficial for these patients who have bony metastasis mm. now if the patient still progresses what is the next option available the uh, prp inhibitor rp inhibitor sir all up are rp inhibitor so you do you go for a genetic testing in these patients uh, if they if they are uh, if they can uh, i mean uh, if they are positive for braca2 or any other mutation you can start them on parp inhibitors so this is the broad management of a crpc if the patient still progresses there are still multiple drugs available which i would not confuse you with even cyclophosphamide has a role in these patients but these are exceptional patients you would not encounter them in your examinations so the the major discussion is about how to manage a metastatic zero m0 crpc five options m1 crpc three options sequencing will be depending upon what the past medication this patient was on another important thing which i missed was bone modifying drugs so which i should have discussed so what are the is your any metastatic patient you have to give him some bone modifying agents what are these bone modifying agents which you are supposed to give sir we have dolendronic bisphosphonate and rank ligand inhibitors bhai start with the basic drug you have to give them calcium calcium and vitamin d how much calcium, 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 calcium do you give them 600 mg sir uh, 600 1200 mg 1000 1200 मिलीग्राम 
HSPC already. patient, HSPC mm. patient. In a Tama. castrate resistant patient, the thing is different. So you you want to uh, a bi prong treatment on this. Mm. HSPC, the idea is to prevent osteoporosis. So this is this all is to prevent osteoporosis. Yeah. Now, in, what is the difference between zoledronic acid in a HSPC versus a CRPC? Can somebody answer Those. that? So dose difference is there, sir. If the what is the difference? sensitive cell, then we have to give it six monthly doses. And for cassette assistant, we have to give monthly doses, so four milligrams. Exactly. Very good. So six monthly, mm. maybe I'm wrong. So because to my knowledge, it was five milligram once in a year, uh, mm. for not four, five milligram once in a year. This was to my knowledge. Maybe it's it's twice in a year. I mean, I'm not very sure about that. But yes, the uh, uh, zoledronic acid in a CRPC setting is to be given once a week. What is the dose of zoledronic acid? Four milligrams, sir. Four milligrams. Four milligram in. Four milligram. Sir, the normal saline and has to be given, sir. How much of a normal saline? Hundred ml. Hundred ml normal saline, sir. How much? Okay, and it has to be given over. Sir, over half an hour to one hour. Four hours. Fifteen minutes. Four milligram. Fifteen minutes. Four hours. Four hours. So any other drug which you can give rather than giving injections, I don't want injections. Rank inhibitor, sir. Denosumab can give, sir. Denosumab. Cheaper drug. Cheaper. Ibendronic. It's an oral. Um, it's a substitute of zoledronic acid. Ibendronic. Ibendronic hmm. is available with the cost of 120 rupees. You give it once a month in CRPC. You give it once in a year hmm. in, in HSPC. Oral medication causes esophageal cancer. So the instruction is that you have to give him with lot of water and ask him not to sit or not to lie down for one hour. Hmm. Simple. So anything else which I missed? Yeah. Do pharmaceuticals for the bone management. Yeah, denosumab, denosumab, they've already discussed. Zonodronic acids, they've already discussed. Is there anything else? The faculty, if, if they want to chip in with some points, which I would have missed. Uh, before the administration of zonodronic acid, we need to check the calcium, albumin, and creatine in every month. Yes. Absolutely. And we, because... we also see. Yeah, correct, correct. Proceed, sir. Uh, because uh, zoledronic acid is uh, contraindicated in the renal function. Correct. And theoretical uh, uh, question. Let's go. Theoretical question. Uh, they they will always be. This is a very fancy thing, but you also have to uh, examine their teeth. Dental checkup. Dental checkup for. Dental checkup is, so you have to document it because it causes. Uh, osteonecrosis. The incidence is very less. Oste osteonecrosis of the joint. The incidence is practically less than one percent. But yes, on paper you have to. Mention and you have to um, in the exam also answer. All right, Ranjan sir, if you have uh, anything to say, sir. Sir, I have a question, sir. Yeah, please. Sir, uh, in Epstein criteria regarding Lodix positive cancer, mm -hmm. uh, there is a many criteria. One is criteria told us. There is a code positivity regarding less than three code positive and written and as a sex in sex ten biopsy. But in that today we generally we use uh, twelve code biopsy. So how much code will be taken in this era? So we will we will certainly take a twelve core. The problem with Epstein's is that this is a very old classification. So this is just for the examination purposes. You just need to understand. In, in today's scenario, if you want to label a disease as a uh, clinically insignificant disease, my recommendation will be there is no guideline. Epstein criteria is an obsolete criteria, but yes, for examination purposes, say that less than 5% of the tissue involved, less than two cores involved, less than 50% of an individual core involved, and glycine 3 plus 3. So this is the only thing only meant for examination purposes. This does not have any, probably does not have any kind of clinical implications. We have had patients who had uh, uh, this uh, low risk, I mean, clinically insignificant cancer within three months, the PSA go high. So it depends upon your biopsy patterns, how much of the tissue you have gone in. So in today's era of MRI and targeted biopsies, I think Epstein criteria doesn't stand to its ground. Okay. Right, Ranjan sir is there? Yeah, yes, yes, uh, Tarun. Uh, uh, Dr. Shivam, are you still present in the platform? Mm -hmm. Dr. Shivam? 
I think he has left. Uh, Tarun, you have made a very precise and but elaborate discussion of the cancer prostate, which is really related to the examinations. And uh, I hope that students are benefited in spite of the fact that due to a lot of difficulties, Dr. Gopal Krishna, who is the chief moderator for the TV class, did not participate because he is traveling from Guwahati to Calcutta. Dr. Tarun Jindal has the uh, ability and the courage to take up this challenge to participate as a teacher for this today's class. I congratulate Tarun. Uh, thank you very much for uh, helping the students to clear their doubts. I'm also happy Dr. Uh, Shivam if he is present uh, because uh, I requested him to be present for today's class. He, uh, he is present. I'll be very grateful for his presence and uh, also Dr. Konishko for his able guidance from as a radio therapy radio therapy for this uh, My pleasure, sir. Yeah, so no, it's, we are very happy that you have taken active interest in this. Uh, I hope the students have benefited. If they have any other question, they can discuss it tomorrow. Tomorrow will be the last class of this session of uh, this last three and a half months. We are conducting this weekend classes. And uh, um, I hope all of you will be present tomorrow in the concluding session. And we will have to thank all the teachers. And you should also participate in thanking them for they have worked so much for your benefit. Thank you, Torun. And thank you, Tonishko and Dr. Shivam, if you are present for uh, attending today's class and helping the students. Thank you all.